Hi class, this is going to be my lecture on um, Sumeria. We're going to con be continuing with prehistory. If I look away, it's only that I'm looking at my notes. Um, I actually tried to do this lecture a couple days ago, but I disappeared. So you think you're the only ones that are having trouble with this new way of learning? Join the crowd. Okay, so today I'd like to talk about Mesopotamia. All of the work is in your book. Uh, Mesopotamia in Greece means um, land between two rivers. This is literally what you've heard all your life called the cradle of civilization. And this is, of course, where Iraq is, where the Tigris, the Euphrates. We are still, believe it or not, uh, incredibly involved in this area um, and um, it seems like we're rushing through thousands of years but bear with me I want you to have this foundation remember we're starting Paleolithic Neolithic this is the end of the Neolithic age um, and the be the end really after Katalhuyuk and Jericho, we're beginning to get into a little bit more refinement of kivis or civilization. Um, these are the origins of towns and villages. Okay, let's get back to Mesopotamia, that land between the Tigris and the Euphrates. It is at this point where humans are going to begin to have an impact on the environment. Now, that's not like global warming, but it is uh, humans are beginning to have an impact on their environment. In what way? Well, these two rivers overflow maybe once, maybe twice, um, depending upon rainfall during the year into a delta that allows the people living alongside the rivers and inland somewhat. Uh, a way to sustain themselves, to grow property. Um, they can even make a dam in that river. They can um, de, you know, make the route a little different. Uh, they can use some of that water for irrigation, uh, some of the runoff. So that ability to both harness nature and what they're getting from it, the runoff, um, crops, farming, etc., is going to create something that we all know as urbanization. What does that mean? That just means they're able to um, store their grain, store their food. People are able to live together, like we discussed in uh, Katahoyuk and other places. And of course, trade, even with people on the other side of the river, with Egypt, with Jericho and further away. So this is a kind of um, new way of living in these communities. And this area, Mesopotamia, became really characteristic of this new way of being civilized. Trade amongst different uh, Mesopotamian or Sumerian cities. What are some of these cities? Um, I guess I told you about them, Uruk. Ur, Lagash, Erdu, Kish. If you look at the map, again, on your Moodle, um, on the Norton um, website, there are fantastic, under the student site, there are fantastic um, pictures, which are layered of the maps. And you'll be able to see all of those maps along the rivers of the Tigris and the Euphrates in that um, cradle of civilization. Okay, as we approach approximately 32, 3100, the Neolithic age gets to the era of writing. Um, it's a revolution. Why is this writing thing a revolution? Because before that, and you'll see in your assignment too, I'm asking you to do an assignment on prehistory history before writing, using, or before writing is used standard manner. Um, all of these artifacts, your book has a number of them, you can look up them. Artifacts are just something of another age. 
these happen to be artifacts before writing is commonplace. Um, so writing is really a revolution. Why? One, it allows for record keeping. Why is record keeping important? Well, they could keep uh, records uh, on how much, um, how many jugs of olive oil are being traded. Maybe they're even using markings for it, but that is considered writing. Um, how many meals or how many months is grain in the um, silo for? Um, that's important because the waters are not overflowing uh, every month of the year. They're going to have to use uh, resources that are in storage for um, a leaner times, right? Okay, what else? They're using writing. What do they use? They're using pictographs or pictures. Uh, Egypt, you know, is famous for that. Cuneiform, which is that wedge-shaped uh, writing. And, of course, finally, why is writing important or reading and writing important? Because you could read, you could write, you could pass your stories along, you could send directions along, etc. So... As we enter the culture of Sumer, which is between Mesopotamia, uh, which is between the Tigris and the Euphrates in that area of Mesopotamia, uh, we're going to look at all of those Sumerian cities, which I mentioned, Ur, Lagash, etc. By the way, Ur is the city that we know that Abraham from the Bible is from. Just something interesting. So we know about Sumeria that there is, in fact, a shared culture, shared religion, that um, they there is some shared common values or beliefs, but there was still strife, uh, tension between the cities, there was competition about trade, um, and we know that um, there was even an attempt to distribute goods and services to different cities in the region. Um, now, once you begin to have storage and um, leadership inside of a community, what do we see? We see, and, and this is true even today, we began to see what are called, what we're going to call then, temple elites. Why are they temple elites? Because they guard inside of the temple the food. Who's more important in a society where food is might be scarce, the people who guard it, the temple elites. Um, then there are farming families, you know, people who farm those foodstuffs who become somewhat important. And then finally, there are slaves. Some of the slaves at this time were just prisoners of war that one town took of taking over another town uh, and or they may be foreigners. Um, okay, so that really ends, you know, the sort of circumstances of what we see in the culture of Sumeria. Finally, when we get to the era of approximately 2900 to 2500, those 400 years are known as what we call the early dynastic period, meaning a dynasty is like, um, uh, like the kings and queens in any country, it's one particular family that is going to pass on rule from one king or leader to another. And this period is um, signified by a lot of conflict between those city-states, a lot of wars, kingship, uh, what we call Lugals, L-U-G-A-L. Those are um, warlords, really. Uh, People who, who come to power because they've got a great army. And finally, I want to tell you the story of the Epic of Gilgamesh. Okay, uh, let me continue now with the um, Epic of Gilgamesh, which is in your book. This is considered to be one of the most important... Oh, excuse me, this shouldn't be there. One of the most important stories... Uh, that has ever been written down, and perhaps the first. 
Um, this is an amazing story about the legendary king of Uruk, one of the Sumerian cities. His military conquests, his heroism, he's known as being somewhat arrogant uh, in his leadership, and a country bumpkin, if you will, called Indiku. Um, and it's kind of a story also about city versus country, or urban versus rural. Um, it's also a story about life and death, the irresistibility of nature and the impossible dynamic of friendship and relationships. Okay, I want you all to look at this story, the relationship that develops between Ndiku and Gilgamesh. They become fast friends. Um, Gilgamesh learns from Ndiku the riches of the country and vice versa um, and also um, friendship they learn about friendship when um, Ndiku dies unfortunately for the relationship and because of the philandering really of Gilgamesh and because he brings Gilgamesh Gilgamesh brings Ndiku into the sort of difficulties of the city, what we see is that you can't bring back uh, individuals from the dead. So it kind of redefines life, death, God, all of those things. So please look at it. It's a beautiful story and highly symbolic. Okay, I just want to take a minute now to talk about the religion of the Sumerian period. Um, during this Uruk period. Uh, the Sumerian gods are really defined with the forces of nature, which you see with Indiku, uh, number one. Number two, during that period, um, the gods and um, the gods in the Sumerian religion were um, seen in human terms, um, that there was some reciprocity between gods and humans and that humans existed to uh, serve the gods and in order to do so and of course this exists in all religions even today offering sacrifices festivals building projects etc you know building temples etc and if you failed to honor the gods well disaster would um ensue Sumerian science and technology. They, um, the Sumerians in general were quite brilliant in terms of invention, ingenuity. They had copper weapons, copper tools. Um, they discovered bronze, which is why we call this the Bronze Age, of course, after Paleolithic, Neolithic, the Bronze Age. Um, they invented wheels, which of course led to chariots, carts, even pottery wheels. Uh, they had drills to put seeds in the earth. Um, they also um, did timekeeping, trade, travel. And in order to do timekeeping, you really needed measuring. They developed a lunar calendar, which some places still use. They divided time into multiples of 60, which we still use. They used domes and arches for architecture. And of course, they developed contacts with Egypt, elsewhere, even with India um, for trade. And so they spread their stories, uh, their myths, their God, their ideas, their art, etc. Um, so what we have here in Sumer are the brilliance of the Sumerians. Uh, we really begin to see the first empires, um, which include, you know, increased civil or civic competition. Uh, we don't know a lot about it, but we believe the power of the elites started to grow, the power of the empires. Uh, there began to be a shift in ideas about the afterlife, uh, meaning that the ideas about the afterlife became greater. Um, but 
Even at that time, Sumeria remained a collection of independent states. That is going to change approximately in 2350. Uh, between 2350 and 2160 BCE, we're going to see the development of an Akkadian culture that is really going to slowly take over the complexion of all of Sumeria. And the leader that does that is somebody named Sargon. Now, if even if you go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which I don't even know if you can today because it might be on lockdown, uh, you could actually see um, sculptures or profiles of this guy, Sargon. Um, he conquers Sumer, all of Sumer, by 2350. And he appointed governors to rule in all the different um, provinces or cities. Now, in this section, we learn a lot about what leadership looked like. Governors, governors representing Sargon in each of these city. Uh, and as a result of doing that, he developed a unified kingdom or an empire. Um, that leadership, that sense of a whole, this unified kingdom, really did reduce conflict, reduce war, reduce the rivalry between all the Sumerian cities and Acadia. They merged their religions, they merged their civilizations, um, and it is believed that um, at this time they named, they were the first um, the earliest surviving empire in uh, world history. And um, they, can, they created what is going to be a dynasty of Ur and the Amorites. And it's going to continue from that 2300 period all the way to 1800. Um, the Amorites are going to give rise to more technological innovation, like the ziggurat, which you can see in your textbook, which is like an early pyramid. Um, and what's inside of that ziggurat? Probably storage for their grain um, and air conditioning for the elites, believe it or not. And also the rulers are going to begin to collect what we call tribute or taxes from everybody. They're going to expand commercially. They're going to develop a centralization of government. Remember, we're back here at learning about leadership um, and a code of laws. Um, and because of their wealth, um, the Amorites are going to become patrons of the arts, of literature, and that is going to set a pattern for rulers to come. Um, and this rise of the Amorites is going to give rise to who's the most famous lawgiver of all times that you probably don't even know yet, Hammurabi. And you've probably heard of him, but not known why he's famous. The Code of Hammurabi is the first real uh, group of laws, set of laws that are set down in Babylonia, another Sumerian town, in approximately 1792. Um, it's quite incredible about Hammurabi. He's going to use the military. He's going to use intelligence, diplomacy, planning, weapons, um, in order to conquer and keep his neighbors docile or from uh, fighting against him. Um, and all of this, including the Code of Hammurabi, is going to be used as a political vehicle of integration. And this is how he's going to weave together this disparate group of cities in Sumeria. Um, this collection of laws is going to be used to rule over the entire empire. And of course, What's good about this is one, it's one set of laws that the whole empire follows, so you always know what the laws are. And there are 282 laws. Uh, they regulate commerce, uh, the use of natural resources, social interactions, 
Like if somebody steals from somebody, what's going to happen? Criminal law, even family law, marriage, divorce, uh, etc. The responsibilities of the aristocrats, responsibilities of the slaves. It's all laid out here. And in your book, you will see some examples of those. Uh, the stratification of society appears to be the aristocrats, the dependents, the laborers, the artisans, um, and women, and even slaves. So you could tell from these laws how everybody, uh, the status of most people within society, how they're treated, what their punishments are, etc. Um, now the legacy of Hammurabi is that he really created a stable society. Um, he helped establish the whole concept of kingship using his laws, using a stable uh, society, and he established the importance of archives um, and legal uh, responsibility also of kings as arbiters of justice. In other words, because they have these uh, laws that can be used by everyone and that are expected to be used by everyone, these kings, like Hammurabi, is going to be the judge, the jury, and the king of the empire. Okay, the next uh, brief lecture I'll give on chapter one are the lectures about the Egyptians.